when you create content, you have to actually do multiple things, right? You have 10 different strategies that you do, and out of those 10 strategies, two might work. Grow on my page from zero to six million followers. Then I created a cat called Grumpy Cat, which is worth like a hundred million dollars right see now. Grumpy Cat. Yeah. You I, created it. This particular person has invented a new way of using technology, and the Innovator Award is for someone deemed a visionary. The individual that we'd like to award today is Spectacular Smith. What's up, everybody? And this is Spectacular Smith, and welcome to the Spectacular Show. Today we have the king of high ticket selling, Mr. Dan Locke. Thank you, thank you, my man. Thank you. Yes, glad man. to be here. Hey, listen, I just went to your two-day high ticket influencer <laughs> event, and it was amazing. <laughs> it was truly mind blowing on like all the things you accomplished. Mm. But for those who don't know who Dan Locke is, mm. can you give them a quick bio of who Dan Locke is? I'm just simply an entrepreneur, but my background is I was born in Hong Kong mm. and I immigrated to Vancouver, Canada, to North America when I was 14 years old. And my mom and dad uh, got divorced when I was 16 years old. So I was the only child in my family. Um, I started my business very, very early on because shortly after the divorce, my dad actually went bankrupt. Mm. So because of business, a bad business partnership, the, the partner took his money and just disappeared. And that left him, left him about, um, when I was 17 years old, about a million dollars in debt. And that wiped him down. Financially, uh, emotionally, he was never the same man again. So as the only child in my family, then I had to take care of my mom. I was living with my mom in a one bedroom apartment at the time. So that's how I got into entrepreneurship. And that's how I started on this journey and fast forward today. And you know, we do a lot of different things where we have a group of companies as you know, right? We serve. CEOs and we are trained closer from all over the world. But, you know, SPAC, interesting. I never thought of becoming an entrepreneur. Wow. I never, ever thought of becoming an entrepreneur. Because as a young kid, like success and money, it didn't, it didn't, it didn't interest me at all. Wow. My biggest dream at the time was because I was getting bullied in school. So I took martial art. I learned martial art. My biggest dream was to open up a martial arts school. That was it. Like to have a few, some few students and I would teach, that's it. That would be like my biggest dream. Now, interestingly enough, now I'm still teaching. I always have that teacher's heart, but I'm just teaching business and, and closing, right? But that's the same thing I do. Yeah, you're an amazing teacher. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, you're an amazing teacher. And when you interview me, yes. you know, one of my guys uh, called me and was like, hey, I was like, man, I need some closers right now for my business. Yes. And he was like, you should look up Dan Locke. Like, that's what he does. He looks for influencers. Uh, and he trained people to look for influencers to close high ticket items for him. Mm -hmm. So I did some homework on you. Yes. And it's surprisingly how God worked. You put us together and you, you reached out to me and I was already researching you. Yes. And it just it just connected like that. But me listening to your podcast, mm -hmm. uh, the Dan Locke show, mm -hmm. it was it's, it's like pretty impactful, man. And I think that- And I know afterwards you closed some sales. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Some boom, yeah. some, some yeah. boom yeah. right there. Some boom. Yeah. Yeah, because I wasn't really charging a setup fee like that. It mm -hmm. was like, you know, it's like, yo, Charge charge the the like, not only charge it, but hit them with a premium price where you know what you deserve because yes. I was starting a relationship off already with a discount. Yes. Yes. And what was the advice you gave to me? Yeah, exactly. So because I think most people, they undercharge and they think, oh, I need to discount my services, right? Uh, that, but what I believe is if you live by price, you die by price. Mm -hmm. That people want, in, in any given time, 20% of the marketplace, they want what's best. They want the premium. Right, but everyone is trying to sell to the bottom twenty, not the top twenty. Right, like example, if if you were to want to have, let's say, LASIK eye surgery, okay, that's a big deal. Do you really want to? You see an ad and say, "Hey, LASIK eye surgery, buy one get one free." Like, do you really want to go with someone like that? Serene. <laughs> like, I don't think so, right? <laughs> hey, fifty percent off today. If you was to do like, no, you want the best of the best. So when it comes to important, I think life purchases, um, anything that's important to people that they, they want what's best. And I believe if you sell to that market or when you have high ticket, like a high ticket offers, you could deliver a better experience 
for the customers. You can provide more value versus when you don't charge enough, there's not enough profit margin, uh, you cannot provide very good experience, then you have to do everything on the cheap, right? And then it creates a very, very bad experience. What is very interesting, and the study has been done, and I'll paraphrase it, but it was like a wine tasting experiment. So they have three bottles and they just put different labels on it, right? And they would tell people, okay, this bottle uh, costs $20. This bottle costs $50, but this bottle here costs $200. Which wine tastes better, right? And the people, they have all these people, they taste it. Oh yeah, the, you know, the, the cheap one, no, but the $200 ones, oh yeah. They were describing mm, the wood and the taste and the flavor and all that. This is the best, guess what? It is the same wine. Wow. It is the same wine. So the question is, why the more expensive wine tastes better? Does it actually taste better? It actually does taste better because chemically in our brain, it triggers a certain part that when you spend more money, studies have been done, that naturally you actually creates more, more happiness. You have high expectations. So the experience is actually better. So personally, when they taste that, 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 that wine, it actually tastes better because of all the chemicals, brain that's happening, right? It's amazing. Mm -hmm. So you are not doing people a favor by not charging enough. You're actually doing them a disservice if you think about it. And this doesn't mean, oh, does that mean that we're greedy, that we want to charge more, more money? That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about charging more money so you can provide a better value to people. And you can have more capital, more money to hire better people, right? To do more marketing, to, to get your message out there, to get your products out there, to get your brand out there, right? That's what I believe in. So why high ticket selling? Because think about if you, let's say you want to generate a million dollars, you can sell something for a dollar and you can make a million, you can get a million customers, right? Or you can sell something for, you know, $10 and get 100,000 customers. Or you can sell something for ten thousand dollars. You only need a hundred customers. So to reach whatever revenue goal, income goal that you have, think about your agency, right? Imagine you're charging low ticket. You need a lot more clients to to get to the revenue that you want. Versus fewer clients, higher profit margins, provide better service because the infrastructure that you need to to serve to serve hundred thousand people versus a hundred people is very very different. Very very different. So I like to keep my business simple where I don't need to, like I can get to a certain revenue goal with fewer numbers, the power of transaction size. So that's why high ticket. Mm -hmm. yeah. And you have a program. Yes. So what I teach all over the world, right, of course, is the high ticket closing program. So what I teach is I take people from all walks of life that doesn't matter if they have experience or don't have experience, that I could teach them the art of closing. And once they develop this skill, what I call high income skill, then they can work with influencers and companies and, and corporations to help them close high ticket sales. Because the, the good old days of putting something together, putting a website and you sell it for a couple hundred bucks, those days are over. It doesn't work anymore. Uh, now, I mean, you do a lot of traffic, so you know exactly what I'm talking about. The, the low ticket offers, at best they break even. Yeah. There's, there's no money in it. All it's designed to do is just bring a customer in the door so that you could offer them something else. The second, the third purchase, right? I call those high ticket offers. So you sell something for a thousand, a hundred dollars, but the, the back end of that, right? The second and third purchases is $2,000, $5,000, $10,000. Those sales, they are very, very difficult to, to be converted through just like a tweet, mm. right? Or just, a, just an email. Those sales need to be done through the phone. And when you have that skill, there's this is huge need in the marketplace that people, companies, they need closers on the phone to close these sales. And that's why, that's what I teach. So out of all the successful companies you've built, yeah. which is, I think, just to name a few that I know of, yeah. just uh, Dan Lock Ventures, mm -hmm. which you pretty much invest in different companies. Yeah. Can you tell me more about that? Yeah, so with Dan Lock Ventures, what we do is because I have the closest team and because of my social media reach. So if there are brands or even personal brands that I see this potential that I would partner up with them and really invest money, time, and also my team, bring what I, everything I have on the table to add value to the company to help them scale. And we form a partnership. 
So instead of someone, if they need sales or they need marketing, they need closers, they need social media, whatever they need, uh, I want to have be able to provide that very selectively, very selectively to help them scale. And that's what we do, right? On, on two sides, on, on, it's interesting because I serve two markets. I serve the, the mass market where it's everybody who wants to develop a skill, a high income skill that's not taught in school. Or I, on this hand, I serve the entrepreneur, the CEO market. So it kind of the both world collide and that kind of, that's what we do in the middle, right? That's, that's kind of almost like a bridge. Yeah. So if somebody wanted to invest, like what are some of the experiences you gain from, because I know it's trial and error, you yeah. fail fast, you learn from it. So what are some of the things that you uh, learned? I'll from tell a story. Uh, in, when I was the first got into investments, I was investing in a bunch of tech companies. Okay. And I invest in, like as an angel investor, I invest in 10 companies. Guess what's back? All 10 lost money. I put all money in 10, not one made money, all 10 lost money, right? Uh, what I learned is don't invest in tech company. <laughs> <laughs> no, but seriously, it's, it's more that the, the, the tech, the, uh, whatever the product is, that's all secondary. That's what I've learned. Number one, it has to, to be about the team and the people and, and the, the leader. Leadership, culture. Like that's number one. If you have a great team, I can have an average product, it will still work. I can pivot, I can tweak, I can do different things. You have a great product, you have a lousy team, it's not gonna take off. But before I thought, oh, if I invest in that, that's a cool thing, right? You see something, that is cool idea. It doesn't mean shit, right? It's 99% execution, 1% idea. So one thing I've learned. Um, and second thing is, in any business, the, the, the most important thing to do with any business, startup, doesn't matter, is to find what I call the optimal selling strategy. You gotta find that one thing that you could acquire customers and break even on at a profit. Until you do that, you don't have a business. Like that's the first thing you gotta crack. Then everything else, then you can, you, you, they will come after, then you can scale. So I look at investments much more like an investment that if, if, if a business, if I'm investing in it, um, how do I add value? I, I'm not a passive investor. I'm more like an active investor. Mm -hmm. If I invest in something, I want to be involved. I want to be able to have certain say. I want to be able to add value. I want to be able to to kind of get my hands on. Okay, what can I do to make this better? I want to improve it. So I don't. So I'm, so I'm not a big fan of of I buy something. I don't think about it. Like that's not what I do. Like real estate, I like to be involved. Which is the best investors? Like if you're gonna like, if I was to ever take investor, everything I ever did was bootstrap. Yeah. But if I was to take investor, I would want investor like that that's gonna be hands on because a lot of people they jump into, uh, they take investors, they take capital just for the money. Yeah. But I tell people all the time if you're looking for that, like get somebody who's gonna actually come in and add more value versus just capital. If you just get and, just capital. and the values have to be have to align. Yeah. Example, let's say if you have an investor, you have a certain goal, right? You want to build this company and say, let's say you have a long-term goal. You want to build from here to here and this is your mission, this is your vision. But the investors may be thinking, oh no, I just want to invest some money. I want my my money out three years, five years and like I don't really care about what you do. Like that you're gonna have a problem, right? Like, cause now everything you do has a long-term strategic point of view versus uh, investor, VC, venture capitals, could be short-term, right? They would say, what am I do? What are we do? Where, what are we doing to hit the, the profit, the revenue we want this quarter? Well, if you're doing anything significant, it might take some time. So you, it's, you make certain decisions that are, may not be good for the longevity of the company, right? So. Yeah, I, I don't believe in that. And, and nowadays, and that's the problem, a lot of VCs went bankrupt. Mm. Like a lot of VCs are out of business because there are not enough good entrepreneurs and ventures for them to invest money in. Because now entrepreneurs, they don't need money as, as early. Like before, yeah, I need to raise X amount of dollars, millions of dollars, now they can kind of bootstrap for a long, long time and to a point where they may never need their money. Right, they can do the marketing. They can do the social media to keep growing and growing and growing. So uh, things have changed a lot, and there's so much money out there. Like there's so much capital out there that people want to put into good use, but there there aren't enough good places. Yeah, let's talk about culture. Mm -hmm. I've been around your team for two days straight. Yes, 
you have an amazing team. I thought my team was amazing, but your team is amazing also. But the, let's talk about culture and like, what do you do to pick the people who you who you actually have join your team and how important is culture to you? Uh, culture, it's strategy for breakfast. Uh, culture is everything. It really is. Uh, doesn't matter what tactic, what you're gonna do. Uh, at the end of the day, it's, it's the team that makes it work. So uh, I do things a little differently. Uh, I'll never hire based on a resume. I'll never hire anybody based on, I've never looked at a resume. Wow. Okay, that's a little bit like, what? Yeah, no, we don't do that. Uh, uh, first of all, if someone applies to work, want to work, join our team, uh, they, I ask them to submit a video. Mm-hmm. Like a video resume. I want to see how they look, how they talk, how they articulate, why they want to join. Uh, and most of my team members are my students. They come from, they, they go through my program, they go through my courses, they see what I do, they have experienced this transformation, it's changed their lives, right? So then when they can see, hey, you know what? I would like to join this mission. I would like to be part of this. And that's how it evolves and then they join my team. So I, I don't really put out an ad and say, oh, I'm hiring so and so and so. That's not quite what we do. It's, it's a little bit interesting. Uh, so anyone who joins the company, the, the strong culture of you know, why we do it and how we do it, which is very, very different, right? Because it's very difficult for us as a hyper growth company that it's it's not like anyone who joins, I tell them, you know, you're looking for nine to five. That's, that's not what we do. Like we work hard. Like we work very, very hard. Like my team gets messages from me like 2 a.m. in the morning, right? Mm-hmm. It's like we work hard. Like if they just want, and, I, and almost in the beginning, I tell them, almost like push people away. Like you think you want to join my team Dan Lock? Let me tell you why maybe you don't want to join team Dan Lock. I tell them like, this is how it work and, and see if they actually want it. Then I put them to a 90 day uh, challenge. Not a probation, like it's like, a, I call them a doofus test. <laughs> Everybody goes through. So we give them 90 days, a lot of challenges, a lot of curveballs, a lot of pressure, deadlines to see how they operate. Because how do you know someone, how they operate in spec? How can you tell that from a resume? You can't. You can't. Like the best way is give them task. Let's see how you operate. So you hire them, say you go from the video mm-hmm. and you say, this person seems like a good fit. Yeah. Then you say, hey, welcome. Yeah. Get through this, walk on this hot fire cold. For 90 days, yeah. Fight the lions, tigers, and bears. Yeah. And if we see you at the end, then it's official. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, up, up front. And I tell them up front, like, this is, these are core values. We have five core values. Uh, harmony, uh, loyalty, harmony, extreme ownership, high performance, and constant learning. Mm-hmm. Those are five core values that my, I live by, my team lives by. So I tell them this, these are core values. Uh, extreme ownership, if you're the ones that point fingers, play victims, you won't, you won't survive a day on my team, right? Uh, if you are don't work with others, you won't last. So like they know that's the core values and they know where the company's going. I spend a lot of time talking about the vision, where we're going. Do you want to be part of that? Some people, they don't want to be part of that. They just want, I just want to do my little thing, you know, go to work and have a little paycheck and go home and I don't want to think about this stuff. That, that's, that's, there are other jobs that you can do that. You don't need to be here. So, and I'm proud to say, I have, you met some of my, my team members, right? Phenomenal. And, and they, some of them, they, they move, they move to, to join our team. Wow, that's powerful. Right? Like, and if, because I'm in Canada, but they moved to like, you know, Joe moved to Bellingham. So it's driving distance to us. That's, that's culture. How big is your team now? About 50-ish people, I think. Nice. Yeah. How many students you have total? Now, uh, we're, uh, for each tight closer, probably on clo- 5,500. Wow. Something like that, yeah. Okay. And so what is a typical day for Dan Lock? Every day is different. Yeah? So I have days where if I am doing uh, PMP, Mm-hmm. Right, if you don't know PMP is, I can explain that. Mm-hmm. Uh, if I'm doing like personal branding promotion, uh, that would be like maybe full day of interview and, and things like that, right? PR, uh, that could be one day. I like to put that on one day. 
content. Uh, if there's some days, it's just full day, I lock myself in a room and just think. Just, you see me walking around with my pen, with a whiteboard. I just think. I try to do that on Friday. Somehow, <laughs> some way, some shit always ends up on calendar on Friday. <laughs> you gotta, you gotta unplug the phone. Yeah. You gotta, you gotta lock the door. So I, I do. I need that thinking time. Uh, it could be that. Uh, it could be I'm meeting with people, um, developing relationships. I focus on more the high level stuff. I don't do as much of the day to day running the business. I have the team who does that. Uh, it could be that. It could be training, of course, teaching and training. That's a big part of what I do. So each day is a little bit different, but it's packed. It's mm -hmm. packed. Not as packed today, but it's yeah. packed. A little, yeah. little break sometimes yeah. is, is good. Yeah. So how important is thinking? Because I know you say you, you need to set time aside just for that. How, how important is that? Uh, I believe business is an intellectual sport. It is not f competing your physical strength. It's this, right? So most entrepreneurs are so busy hustling, right? They're hustling. And you see this on social media a lot, like people talk about, oh, you gotta hustle. This culture of hustling, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but you need to hustle, but that's not what creates breakthrough. I mean, spec give me an example, like give me a period of time, maybe in the beginning, in the part of your, part of the period of business that you were just like grinding it. You were just hustling it, but things weren't working well. Give me an example. So we had a, a algorithm change for Facebook. Yeah. And that was like what we was making a majority of our money from, yeah. from our company, Awazar. Yeah. And this is at the time we was working with like 100% with our only celebrities and Facebook knew we had this little hustle going on yeah. and they wasn't getting paid from it. Yeah. And they was trying to introduce what they call, I think it was called um, instant articles at yeah. the time. Yeah. And they wanted us to do that, but we was killing and making millions off of this way of selling traffic against, uh, as against traffic. Mm. And they cut my revenue down by 80% mm. in one month. Mm. Like it was just like, yep. and then yep. it just kept declining. Yeah. So I kind of seen it coming. So I started setting up a pivot mm. and, and that pivot was for a different personality brands, mm. inspiring talent. Yeah. And I had to like, I had to just go crazy. I had to read all the books I can read. I read over a hundred books. I had to take programs mm. by programs. Mm. I had to go to seminars. I joined um, uh, or organizations. Finan and, uh, finances. Yeah, and then I created an advisory board, mastermind, mm -hmm. and I just was going hard, just mm. like figuring it out as it as it went because I had I have a team at, yeah. at that time I had like tons. Of, I don't I can't remember how many people was working for me at the time, but I had. They had families to mm. feed, and I know everything was on me. Mm. So every since everything was on me, I just felt like I couldn't fail. So I was just on every phone call. You know, <laughs> it was crazy. Like I was sleep. I was up. I was getting like three hours of sleep every single day, just going crazy. And I was mm. just, I was in the office every day. I, I'd come. I, well, I never really got there too early, but um, I'd get there like ten o'clock, but I wouldn't leave until like nine. Mm. And I was doing that like every single day, weekends, every. Saturday, Sunday, just going crazy. Mm. Yeah. So, so you so can see, grind you were, so this is grinding and hustling, but what got you out of that wasn't just grinding more, but you're looking for new answers. You're looking Absolutely. for new directions. Yep. That's, so that's, that's thinking time. You need thinking time to do that. You need to give yourself some space, some distance and say, hey, you know, not just the question, how can I work harder? That's a lot of, a lot of entrepreneurs ask this question. How can I work harder? Mm. Right. What, what can I do? What can I do? Well, sometimes it's not just what can I do. It's why am I even doing this at all? Right. Do I need to take a totally different direction? Do I need to reinvent my model? Do I need to uh, hire a new team? Like, what do I need to do? And that's what most people don't do. And they don't reinvent. Every single time I have a breakthrough in, in my career, it's because there's something that happened, doesn't work, then you change it. But now I'm smarter and wiser now. Before that happens, something is working, I'm already thinking about the links. It's working very well, but it will stop working in six months, a year, two years, who knows? Doesn't matter, I've got a plan B. 
I've kind of blends plants. So one thing I liked uh, from Jack Ma Alibaba, he said, first of all, he has a business plan for 102 years. A business plan for 102 years. Jesus. That's a visionary. It's a true visionary. It's a true visionary. Mm -hmm. And when he was, he was on stage and, and people asked him, oh, did you see this on YouTube? He said, what do you think of Alibaba? It's one of the biggest companies in the world, right? How do you feel? about like now this size. Now you expect he would say what, like? Yeah, I feel good. Yeah, I feel good. He said, every day I feel like I'm walking on thin ice. Wow. That's an entrepreneur. That's a great entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. As big as he is, because mm -hmm. he knows one mistake or the, the company could fall. Like have that kind of mentality, it's, it's great. And I have that kind of mentality. That's why uh, at the event, someone was asking me, how do I think this way? You saw my model, you see how, how I map these out and, and like everything that I do. And I said, because I'm paranoid, because I want to make sure that this is indestructible, that it's unsinkable. And it's very different from just, I want to make a quick buck. Yeah, I think that's super important to think ahead. Yeah. Especially in the space I'm in, yeah. you have to think ahead. Social how many, how, media, how, oh many how many celebrities, how many entertainers, right? How many performers? Hey, this is good. I'm doing my thing, right? By the time they can't perform or they get a bit older, they're not as famous or whatever it is, suddenly flat line. Flat, right? Uh, athletes is all the time, right? By the time they hit it, or you, you, you when you can play the sports you play in, you are making a lot of money, like millions of dollars, then suddenly now like, oh, that's too late. They don't plan ahead. Yeah, well, what would I do now? Well, there's kind of not much you can do. Right? And while, while they're making the money, they're already blowing all the money. And that's, that's the sad part, because I talk to a lot of these guys. A yeah. lot of these guys are my friends. And when they're in it, they don't want to hear nothing. Yeah. They feel like, oh, I got this. Like, this is never going to leave. This Everybody feel like when some shit is going really good, it's never going to end. Yeah. But everything comes to an end. What it goes up, comes down. Comes That's down. the realest shit ever. Yeah, and usually it comes down a lot faster. Yes, and when it comes, it comes. It comes, right? So, I, so when I talk to these guys and I try to talk to them and help them monetize or come up with a game plan and just give them back and value, 90% don't listen. <coughs> they don't get it. They don't, they don't get it. They haven't it. seen, they haven't experienced hardship. They haven't experienced enough ups and downs. Yeah. Right? So I feel like you gotta go broke three times mm. in order to, to keep your wealth. Yeah. First time, you just spend it on a bunch of dumb shit <laughs> and just lose it all. Yeah, Second it. time, you're like, hey, I ain't spending on a bunch of dumb shit. This time, I'm an invested. Yeah. Then you just fuck the investment up. Yeah. And then the third time you get in, it's like, I'm no, <laughs> nobody's taking this. Yeah. I'm not messing this up. I'm not making no dumb investments. Yeah. Then that third time is when I think that that's pretty accurate. Yeah, that's I think that's maybe I've gone through more than when two times. Yeah, but yeah, third. I, yeah, third time probably. See, you're good now. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. Yes. Yeah. So I look look ahead. I think ahead, and that's thinking time. Yeah. And then people ask, so how do you do thinking time? Like what it is? I mean, you sit there and just like like meditate. Like what is that? Mm -hmm. To me, thinking time is very simple. I would take a uh, usually usually my whiteboard or my journal. I would ask myself some questions. I'll take some time to craft a good question. And I would just give myself time to think to answer that question. That's thinking time, that's it. So let's say uh, if, should I make XYZ investment? Okay, and then I would think, what are the pros, what are the cons, right? What is the upside, what's the downside? Can I live with the downside, right? What, what, what resources would it take? What bandwidth would it take, right? What if it doesn't work? What, what, what if it works, how would that work? Like, so just think, that's thinking time. Uh, Henry Ford said it best, right? Ford Motors says, the thinking is the hardest work there is, and that's why so few people engage in it. That's very difficult, just to think about the business. Not much easier just to get busy, right? I'll do more, I'll do more. But sometimes busyness is a form of laziness because you don't want to face what is going on. Right? Think of, yeah, right? Think about the, what happened to your Facebook. If now you, now you know you're wiser, smarter, whatever is working, but if you have thinking time, so this thing is going well, I'm doing millions of dollars, what if it stops working? Mm -hmm. 
if you had the thinking time, what if it stops working? You would have developed other things. So when this happens, like, okay. Yeah. yeah. My, my competitors, they was doing 45 million a year. Yep. Ain't have no thinking time. <laughs> when that Facebook changed, they flatline. Yeah. Like that. But I was already, like you said, I had that thinking time. I, I have thinking time during meditation. Yeah. So that helps me out. Like yeah. a lot of my great ideas come from meditation. Yeah. And just like you, I mean, you performing, you're doing tour. Most people were like, I'm, I'm good. But no, you're already transitioning off. Mm -hmm. Hey, what if I don't do tours? Then what's what what the next 10 years going to look like? You're transitioning Absolutely. and becoming an entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. So when you don't do this, you can still do that. Great. That's awesome, right? But most people don't have that insights. They don't have that. They, they, don't, they don't have that wisdom. It's the human nature. Things are good, what's the problem? Right. right. So out of, how many companies do you have right now? One, two, three, four, uh, seven, eight. Yeah, I don't count. Eight, maybe. Eight? <laughs> yeah. Okay. And you can say it's pretty successful. Revenue is, yeah. what would you say? Eight figures? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So you're pretty successful. Yeah. What are you grateful I don't, for? I don't think I'm successful, but... So, to the average person, yeah. that's pretty much great success, yeah. right? Yeah. Of course, us as entrepreneurs, we always want to be better, and yeah. we're our worst critic, yeah. right? It's like, sometimes I do something amazing, and everybody's like... My, my friend jokes about it all the time. My uh, friend named is Nathan, Nathan Patel, right? Yeah. And I was sitting there having a conversation with him. I was like, man, I ain't accomplished nothing yet. And he looked at me, and he was like... I was like, what? why are you looking at it? He was like, yo, Spec, come on, bro. <laughs> Don't ever say nothing like that again. I was like, what? He was like, you ain't accomplished nothing? He was like, you got the second fastest growing, I mean, you got the, the, the highest second, highest grossing tour of the year. He's like, he just started naming everything. You're an entrepreneur, 360, Inc. 5000, bestseller author. Like he started naming all this stuff. And I was like, you really be watching me, huh? <laughs> so, but I was just like, I understand that. But I feel like I'm not what, like, I didn't hit that billion dollar mark. Or I don't, like, where I want to be, mm. I'm not at right now. Yeah. So to them, to the outside world, they feel like, Spec, you got everything. Mm. Like, you you act like, I, and I feel like mm. this is just the beginning. Like, yeah. I'm in my early 30s. It's like, I, I, I feel think like I, I reached it yet. So I feel you. I think any success, super successful people, they always have this dissatisfaction. Yeah. Right? It's this... Not quite there, not mm -hmm. quite there, not good enough. And that's what, what drives us, it's what drives us. So yeah, the, the way that you were asking me about what, what am I grateful for? Yeah. Everything, like my, my family, uh, my wife, uh, my health, my, my team, uh, my students, or everything, friendship. I think things have changed quite a bit for me because for, I would say, let's say from 20 to 30 years old, I'm sure you've experienced this, from me from 20 to 30 years old, I was driven more by success, more by ego. Look at me, look at how this the kind of stuff. Um, then that has transitioned now what drives me is more significance, right? Transitioning from success to significance. That is not just about chasing accomplishment and all these things. It's about more what I could do. How can I utilize my gifts to, to, to impact more people? So, I mean, that has shifted significantly for me, right? So I'm grateful for what I have. I'm grateful for what we've done so far and but what drives me, the, the motive does matter and what drives me change, right, change. And funny enough, when you focus on significance, you automatically get success. Mm. You don't need to think about it, right? People chase money, they wanna chase money. Don't chase money, chase needs, chase problems, chase like solving people's problems. Money comes, money's a byproduct. People chase money, don't get money, that doesn't last. And you're doing a powerful job at that because at the event, yeah. the high ticker influencer event that you yeah. do, it was a lady almost in tears yeah. saying how much you impact their life, how you're giving back and how she's so grateful for you and the things that you're doing for others yeah. and what you did for herself. Yeah. And, um, 
and from what she did for herself, like she was literally in tear, tears. Like, how does that make you feel just knowing you, you have that much impact that you're providing to the world? I just want to do more. I just want to do more. I, I, am, I am addicted to that process that I guess maybe because when I was younger, that I felt like I didn't get a lot of help. I have, I have my mentors, but really I didn't get a lot of help from anybody. Like it was more try to figure stuff out on my own and self-made. And now when I could do this, then I should do it. It's like when you have, it's when I said like on stage that with great power comes great responsibility mm -hmm. because now I have to reach, I have to influence, I have to skill. So why not use it? And if, if, if it's like if it's like they're saying if it's not me then who, mm -hmm. right? If I don't do it then who's gonna do it, right? And is it easy? It's not easy. It's not easy at all, right? Uh, but I just feel that I'm obligated that I have this responsibility that to to do this, to to impact influencers, to give more people the skills that they need, um, to help young people, right? To when they graduate from school, that they're not ready, they're not equipped to, to handle what's going on in the real world. Right? It's a big problem. There's a lot of problems like debt and all these things, right? I, I want to give people an alternative. What, what has worked for me, then maybe they don't have to make the mistakes that, that I made. They still make some mistakes, mm -hmm. but hopefully less. Hopefully less. So you just talked about people who's trying to figure it out basically, yep. right? And not making the same mistakes you made. Yep. What was one of the biggest mistakes that you made in entrepreneurship that you learned from? Greed. Mm. That I think because being, you can see being the concept of circling, circulating on social media, you see on Instagram a lot, certain lifestyle, drive a certain car, and this and that, and this and that. Um, and I like nice things, don't get me wrong. It's just people get into entrepreneurship because I want to make some money. It's not like the worst idea to be an entrepreneur if you just want to make some money. Okay, it's, it's, it's like, I, it's, you ask anybody, you say, I want to, why do you want to be an entrepreneur? I want more freedom. It's like, why do you have, want to have babies and kids? I want more free time. <laughs> it's like the opposite of that. Mm -hmm. Because once you're an entrepreneur, you don't have more freedom, you have less freedom. Absolutely. Right? Like before, nine to five, five days a week, a job, that's fine. As an entrepreneur, is it nine to five? Hell no. <laughs> <laughs> no way possible. Right? It, 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 is it, it, it's not nine to five, it's 24 seven. Mm -hmm. It's seven days a week. And and doesn't end. It, it, it's not like, oh yeah, well, it doesn't end. This is once, it's like when you, you chose this path, this is what you do, right? It's ongoing, It's it never stops. It's crazy, right? So. But people get into this, oh yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna start a business and I'm gonna do a few things, I'm gonna sell some stuff and I'm gonna make all this money. That alone is such a, such a weak, uh, non-sustainable motivation. And it's what happens. Let's say you do succeed. You're one of the top few percent that quote unquote, made it to, I don't know, a million dollars a year. Hypothetically, cool, million dollars a year. Well, to sustain that, like it's one thing to become successful, it's a whole other thing to stay successful. So that's a whole other conversation. So most people got into it for the wrong reasons. If, if that's your motivation, I wanna, and, and me too. In the beginning, my motive was to just make enough to provide for my mom, that was it. I make enough to provide for my mom. That was my only motivation. I wanna make my mom proud. I wanna take care of her. From there, you know, I not want a nicer life for myself. I've got a home, I've got a car, right? Let's say you, you, you get all of that. Now, what? What people don't understand, you see this in, again, entertainment industry. Let me, they buy a lot of stuff. And I like stuff, but don't think those stuff would fulfill you. They don't. They don't. You, they don't. You should buy one car. Let's say, you don't remember you bought the first, what's the first like nice car you bought? Bentley GT. Okay. And you've been wanting that car, right? Yeah. Yeah, you're excited, you got that car. Uh, how long did that last after you got the car? Three days, a week. It was, it was gone. It was like, I was just sitting in the eh, parking lot. Yeah. 
<laughs> right? I don't even care about like cars and stuff like that now. Just cause That's what I mean. I've been there, done that. That's what I mean. Like, yeah. Yeah. He's like, uh, right? And then, but a lot of people, they get stuck into that. Then yeah. we get the next one. Yeah. Well, you get an next and then what? You get another Lambo. Okay. That's how long. Yeah. And then what? Human beings, the way we are wired, we do not get satisfaction from those things. It's so short lived. We get satisfaction from impacting people, helping people, doing something that's significant. It's, it is wired in us. It's wired in us. And that's why you notice, let's say when you help somebody, just help somebody. The joy, the, the satisfaction that you get, like, whoa, like, mm-hmm. where's this good feeling come from? Like, it's incredible because it's not DNA. I truly believe it's not DNA. For like, when you do that, like, whoa, this is, this is nice. And you see that that is what drives an entrepreneur. An entrepreneur is an artist in commerce. We paint with our skills. We turn our vision into reality. That's all it is. Some people, they do it through music. Some people do it through drawing. We just do it through product and services. It's the same. If this is a masterpiece. When you build a company, this, this, this is a masterpiece. When you do an event, this is my masterpiece. That's what it looks like. It just, we do it in a different way. But if you do it just, I just want to make a quick buck. It's a horrible reason to start as an entrepreneur because you would get into it and you, you'll be shocked how tough it is. You're like, holy shit, this is hard. And you want to give up. Yeah. It's only when you love it, you're passionate, then yes. you keep going and going and going. Mm-hmm. If you just want a quick buck, you're not, you're not going to survive. You're not going to survive, period. It's like the, you have a great car, it's the wrong fuel. It does not work. Yeah. That's what I see. Last question. What is your top three books and why? Ooh, that's a good question. I would say, I'm trying to think. 80-20 principle, I like. That's from uh, Richard Koch about focus on what's important. That's a, that's a great book. A lot of people have, have heard that book. Uh, at this book, I really read again and again to think about 80-20 principle. Uh, there's another book, uh, The Art of War. From a business perspective, The Art of War. I think it's a great book. Uh, there's also another book called The uh, Surrender Experiment, which is more like a spiritual book. Uh, but that had an impact in my life that basically teaching you to surrender and let go of the need to control, which is very difficult for entrepreneur, right? Mm. Very entrepreneur. Because in life, I believe we go through four stages. And I think that's a good segue. First, the first stage in life is called life happens to me, to me. So life just happens to me. I, I have no control. Things just happen. Uh, it's more like a victim mentality. Life just happens. You hear people, oh man, it just happens, man. There's nothing I can control. Life happens to me. That's the first stage, which majority of the population, stage one. Stage two, stage two is what I call life happens by me. By me, meaning, right? It is, it's me, man. It's like, I make it an entrepreneur. I make it happen. I do whatever it takes, right? I will move the mountain. I will hustle. And most people, if you live it better, you live in stage two. And most people live in stage two. Life happens by me. And I've operated in stage two for many, 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 many years of my life. Uh, then I realized there's a stage three and four. Stage three is life happens through me. Meaning that now you're not attached. You're striving, but you're not attached. So you are achieving, but you're not attached. Very difficult. That's very, very difficult. So it's like Bruce Lee, no way as the way. Live for the philosophical, but life happens through me. Because sometimes things that we do, things that happen, it, entrepreneurs, it may not happen in the time frame that we want. Like, I want to hit this in six months. If you're, if you're at stage two, it drives you crazy. Yeah. You'll be like, man, I try everything. But if happen, life happens through, maybe it's not meant to happen in six months. Why does it have to happen in six months? except the, the milestone that we set for ourselves. So if you ask me, 
before I would like I was I'm a to do goal list kind of person. Stage two, stage three, I'm much more relaxed. So this, yeah. So the way that I do things, the way my goals, I'm just being, I'm operating, right? So then stage four is life as me. So you see life, you as one. That's more enlightened stage, right? Certain Buddhas or, or Christ would, would have that kind of enlightenment. They see everything as, as one, right? Sometimes in meditation, you might get to that stage, perhaps, right? So, but I think people operate stage two, stage three, where that's where you want to live. It's very difficult though. Stage of flow, it's very, very difficult because we want to control. Now it's like, I do, but I'm not attached. Mm. Not easy. But when you're not attached, guess what? Things come. Things happen to you. That relationship that just came out of nowhere, you didn't work hard for it. It just happens. It just happens. Not because you work hard, things, opportunities, deals, and people, they just, it just happens. It's, it's a very organic process. I know it sounds a little like, oh, come on, Dan, it's a little... Woo woo. I'm no, not, it makes it's, sense. It's not, it's not woo woo. This is not woo woo at all. This is when you can get to that point. Any high level entrepreneurs, you know, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. Yeah. Matter of fact, I do got one more question. Mm. If you was to meet your 18 year old self. Yeah. Okay. What advice would you give him? Find a mentor early. I found a mentor very early on. I still think, even I met my mentor in the first uh, 20 some odd years old, found a mentor early and really just learn from a mentor, uh, be humble and just learn from someone that's been doing, done that, who shares the same values. Uh, that, that would short, shortcut your learning curve a lot. I would not have lost all that money, made all the mistakes if I had like a good, like seeking good mentors, it will not have happened. All the mistakes that I made is all ego. It's, whenever ego is involved, that costs money. Like it's either, oh, I don't need to listen to that. I can figure it on my own. Or yeah, I know I know better and, and you know, don't understand. I don't need to ask people. Every single time that happens, bad, like bad shit happens, right? Either you lost money, you lost time. It's, it's, ne it's never good. It's never good, but whenever you are, whenever I'm humble, listen, learn, ask, see the advice, then that's how I avoid a lot of mistakes. So I'm a great student. I learn from everybody. Just before this interview, I was learning. I was mm -hmm. asking questions. I'm learning all the time. It's not, you cannot be a good teacher without being a good student. And I'm always a student. So people, say, although like, it's, oh yes, Dan, king of high ticket sales. I, I don't see, I see myself as a student of closing. Mm -hmm. I'm always a student of closing. I'm always a student of business. So that's the way I see it. Be humble. All right, well, how can everybody find you? DanLoth.com. I'm on social media, D-A-N-L-O-K.com. YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, all the social media channels, I'm on there. Well, thank you for being my first interview. I bet you didn't know that <laughs> on my podcast. Oh, wow. Yeah. Wow. Thank you, man. Thank welcome. you for being on the show. Welcome, welcome.